Hey Measuring Hero, Jay here. Um, we decided today to do uh, a little bit of a deep dive into the uh, world, the wide world of uh, aerospace metrology. And uh, um, like many things, I know very little about aerospace metrology and we began to do some research uh, on the subject so the, uh, in preparation of today's video blog, but what we realized is there is uh, someone in the organization that has literally decades worth of experience in the field of aerospace metrology, and luckily for us, uh, he has agreed to join us all the way from the United States. So uh, uh, with us today is Randy Joyner. Uh, Randy, once again, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. Oh, Jay. Thanks for having me. Oh, of course, of course. It's, it's uh, my honor to have you with us. Um, Randy, before we, we dive into uh, aerospace metrology, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, I um, started working at Pratt Whitney uh, of Aerospace Facility in 1978. And at the time, uh, you know, you learned by working with others in the organization that are currently doing the inspections and I started in a department that was doing 100% of over inspection for every part that goes into an aircraft engine. So 100% inspection. Wow. Yes. And so, you know, the department when I, I was in had different areas for layout inspection, uh, tool inspection, bearings, airfoils, uh, NDT, and we also supported all of our uh, engine assembly operations. So we were right off of the experimental ex assembly floor where they did all the new engine development. So working in that organization, I got quite a significant uh, experience learning about all facets of inspection. Wow, absolutely. So you've been doing, uh, you've been measuring aircraft engine components uh, since the 70s. That's, that's absolutely, <laughs> absolutely mind-blowing for me. Uh, what, what, how did they measure, um, I don't know, let's take an airfoil blade or, or any component. How did they measure back, at, uh, back uh, then? So, yeah, it, at, everything we did was with height gauges, indicators, um, you know, Cadillac gauges, we called them, where you had a micrometer gauge to adjust your height of your indicator. Um, you know, you had to do all your setups manually on a bench with an angle iron or put it on a uh -huh. rotary head to be able to spin it and measure relationship of features as you rotated parts. Um, and airfoils were truly re unique because we had to do setups and measurements using shouter graphs with a thing called a sidearm comparator where your part was set up on a platform next to the lens of the um, shouter graph and you had these pivot bars that came down and touched parts and there was a parallel set in front of the shouter graph so you could actually sketch and measure features off of the image on the shadow graph. Off of the, off of the, uh, that must have taken forever. How long would it take to, to measure uh, uh, an airfoil using a, using a, a shadow graph? A couple graph? of days. <laughs> oh my gosh. And you had to do 100% inspection and every blade took a couple of days to do? Right. Yes. Wow. Well, a lot of times, it, since it was an oversight inspection, you would measure one or two of a set of parts just to make sure their, you know, reporting was all good. Sure, sure. Uh, okay, well, that's how they did it then, a couple days for, for one airfoil. Uh, how, how are they doing it now? Um, nowadays, with the CMMs and advanced measurement systems, you can literally set a part on a machine, touch off some features, have the machine touch off all your alignment points and then scan sections in the matter of, you know, 30 seconds to a minute per airfoil section. So what used to take a um, couple of days, nowadays would take, you know, 
half an hour to an hour tops. Wow. So wow. quite a significant change in technology over time. Absolutely. What what uh, what are some of the challenges of uh, of doing it that way, using a CMM, going from a shadow graph to a to a CMM? Well, you know, you have to understand your coordinate systems and how their relationship is set up. Um, you know, on especially some of the casting airfoils before the features are machined, you have to touch off the airfoil itself to set up your coordinate system. So, you know, balancing it in through the computer software is quite challenging. Um, the other thing um, is nowadays they're a lot more aggressive with the airfoils. So, you know, where we used to, you know, put a one millimeter shaft touching the part to make our little shadow graph charts, um, that would cause inaccuracies because your the tip of the contact would not be hitting your actual airfoil section because of the shape of the airfoil bending. So where an airfoil used to be straight, now they're bent along the inside to the outsides to create a better airflow. And because of that, when you go in to measure, say, this little gap of my finger, you're actually touching mm -hmm. out here near the end of the finger and you're not getting the right data. So with a CMM, you have to ensure that you're oriented 3D in measuring the features correctly. Okay, so I'm going to try to say this back to you to test my understanding. So, so one of the, the, the clear challenges is because of the new complex geometries of the airfoil blade, uh, the position, the exact position of these very, very tiny uh, uh, contact points you know, uh, on the CMM uh, could mean the difference between a, a good measurement or a bad measurement. So actually that location uh, is, is, is critical and challenging, yeah? It is. Um, as a matter of fact, it, 10 thousandths of an inch shift in radial location can cause a tenth of a degree or more of inaccuracy of the measurement. What? Okay, okay so an inaccuracy of the measurement uh, in relationship to the entire design aircraft engine, could, what could, right. that, the design what could that equal? Well, okay. I mean... Okay. If your part is marginally within your tolerance and you're off by a tenth of a degree, you may be calling a part bad, which when it's actually good, or you may be calling a part good when it's actually bad. You, you don't know. So yeah. the whole idea is you need to ensure your setup in the critical nature of the data you're collecting. Um, because, you know, again, it all goes back to you know, the designs are a lot more aggressive because they need a lot better performance um, to be able to get efficiencies needed to, you know, in the new modern day engine where it uses a lot less sure. fuel. Sure, sure. Yeah, so efficient, like, 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 uh, like we've seen in automotive, uh, uh, just everything's gotten so, uh, you know, the need to be efficient uh, has just really squeezed out any opportunity for a wide open tolerance. Uh, um, so it sounds right. like the same, the same applies here. Um, Randy, it, it sounds like we have a lot to dive into. Uh, uh, I, I feel like there's a lot, uh, we can go way deeper into how we currently uh, do those measurements now uh, and maybe even what the future of these measurements could look like. Uh, is there, if, if you or someone from your team has time uh, can we uh, kind of deep dive into some of that? I'm sure, you know, somebody from the team would be glad to help you with diving deeper into these features because, you know, it, again, it's the critical nature of the measurement. Um, being part of ZEISS, we always want to do the best we can and keep things as accurate as we can. So, you know, having a team that truly understands these measurements and can help support the people using the equipment is you know very important, um, you know, because again you have to measure the parts correctly, mm -hmm. so that now the people in design can understand what they're doing and how they're 
you know, the parts will affect performance in an engine. Um, being, you know, that I started on the experimental side, I was there when they designed the first, say, PW4000 engine 40 years ago. And, you know, for them to be able to measure, the, you know, parts and track performance of an actual engine to the measurements, you know, that's critical in development of an engine process. So, for example, on a turbine airfoil, the tip clearance as it rotates in the engine, moving one ten thousandths of an inch can increase efficiency significantly as much as, you know, five to ten percent improvement because any air slipping by the tip of the airfoil is a cost in performance. I mean, your, your, your wealth of knowledge and, and, and uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, it's an honor to have you on our team because uh, uh, your, your wealth of knowledge and, and, and background is, uh, is really special. So thank you. Oh, uh, thank, thank you for you. joining us. And uh, um, yeah, yeah. Th thanks for uh, lending your insight to, uh, uh, to this topic. Uh, I'm sure we're going to call upon you um, uh, periodically as we continue to deep dive through this subject. But for now, uh, thank you for joining us in the United States. I know it's early for you, and I know we're still at home. So thank you for opening uh, your home to us and, uh, and joining us. Appreciate it. Oh, and thanks for having me. I truly enjoy it. Absolutely. And, uh, and for you out there, thank you for continuing to join us uh, uh, on our video blogs. Uh, and uh, continuing to learn with us. And uh, um, I sincerely hope that you continue to join us uh, every Thursday. And please uh, continue to stay healthy. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next Thursday. Cheers. Bye.